talk about my artistic practice in relation to the occult, specifically in terms of our relationship with the other and the unknown, something which is... Um, oh, sorry again, can I turn off the mic because they're all very dark, my images. Uh, the unknown, which is common to both spirit photography and modern forensic photography. Uh, and also I'll say, all, all, all through this, um, you can just assume the work is mine if I don't say otherwise, because I haven't captioned it very well. Uh, this is very old work, um, illustrations for the turn of the screw, which is obviously a ghost story. Um, and I found that the occult kept popping up in my research all the time uh, in my illustration and fine artwork um, because I'm very interested in the uncanny um, and also emotion, women, domesticity, hysteria. Uh, this is a film I've made in relationship to um, Charcot, the 19th century neurologist, uh, looking at hysteria as a dissolve of the border between the physical and the mental, which is also related to the occult. Um, and I also completed a graphic novel adaptation of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness in 2010, in which I explored ways of telling the subjective story of the ghosts that haunt uh, Marlowe and Kurtz. Um, and in this, I, f I, I uh, came across a lot of spirit photography and sort of a way of having two layers of reality in an image. This is one of my drawings. So, um, a lot of my work also explores the physical manifestation of mental or intangible phenomena, how the emotional resonance or energy of trauma can physically affect, uh, can affect physical space, um, and how this can be depicted visually. Um, and in parallel to this, the concept of residual haunting um, describes the same situation, uh, the idea that a traumatic event has left some sort of psychic scar on space and time. Uh, residual haunting is the most common um, type of haunting to appear in ghost stories, where you have an entity caught in endless repetition of an event which caused their death. Uh, the psychic impression is caused by the fact that energy can't cease to exist, uh, just changed form. So when traumatic events take place, a higher level of energy is discharged and retained in the environment. And so I try to find ways to make that visual. I'm also very interested in abjection, um, and Julia Kristeva's writing about the abject and the uncanny. Um, central to the idea of abjection is the idea of a border, something which demarcates us from that which we dread, um, from the unknown, from the unclean, and the crossing of this border is an abject act. So in relationship to this, um, I want to look at uh, William Thomas Stead's quarterly uh, publication, Borderland, a quarterly review and index of psychic phenomena, which he published for four years between 1893 and 1897, and uh, sort of fairly successfully, but he was so very earnest in his belief that uh, it's, it's a real joy to read. Um, one response to Borderland at the time came from Sir Edwin Arnold, who wrote that the magazine may, we may well directly diminish that foolish and fatal dread of death which mankind owes to theology. The idea of this foolish and fatal dread is a thread that runs through the occult, the abject, and my current practical research into violent crimes and violent deaths. Um, it's not just a fear of dying, but a fear that is associated with all death um, and the unknown. And when we're faced with the unknown, we create defenses. Um, so the late Edwardian and uh, no, no, the late Victorian and early Edwardian times was a period of global and mental expansion, in which uh, people were suddenly confronted with the proximity of the other. So Borderland and other kinds of periodicals uh, were, in my opinion, a manifestation of the human need to contain and know the unknown, something which we still do today through periodicals. And so my own work is an attempt to find meaning in horrific events, to create a space to confront and answer a series of moral questions. And I use drawing as a method to explore questions around our modern proximity to the unknown and the abject, um, and the idea of the ambiguity of the borders of body and identity. So I think we're in a time and place today where the world is suffering from a crisis of identity that manifests in specific kinds of violence against individuals that we perceive as other. Uh, from migrants to religious enemies to the victims of police shootings in America, uh, which is mostly what I'm going to talk about today. So I'm going to talk mostly about one series of drawings called Last Scene, which are drawn with reference to CCTV footage and police photography of the last known recorded image of a person before their disappearance or death. This is a, a bystander photo of a man called Walter Scott, who was shot in the back by a police officer. Uh, this is a drawing. So I've chosen to work with pencil in this series because it seems like such a democratic and ordinary material. But as I explore it further and further, I find that the physicality of pencil and paper can really explore um, sensitive and complex themes simply through its materiality. And like photography, it has a capacity for documenting reality, but also a capacity for mystery. 
um, these are some more um, reference images that I'm, I'm using and the resulting drawings. Um, I make the drawings in two textures of graphite, so you create a surface which is um, both matte and shiny, a bit like a photographic negative. Um, they have a very shifting relationship with the light. It's very hard to photograph them, but I couldn't bring them with me today. So you actually, in real life, have to observe them very forensically and move around uh, to see them kind of out of the corner of your eye. I really find these kinds of photographs fascinating because they're taken, they're not taken for artistic purposes. They're um, taken to record a traumatic or violent event in as stark and objective detail as possible. The composition is not important, but patterns always start to emerge of this sort of distant shot where photographers can't get close enough about heads, empty spaces, the barriers shielding us from the gruesome scenes and these sort of unthreatening landscapes that become suddenly disturbed by the tape and police cars um, charged with something sinister through the real banality and blankness of the photograph. So they represent a space, the spaces of crime represent a space beyond, literally beyond the border, beyond this crime scene tape that we should not have reached, but we have. So in Borderland, the publication, Stad returns over and over again to the idea of a world beyond our reach, but he's both excited and fearful. He talks about these unexplored tracts, an, an immense ocean of truth lying unexplored, a world beyond the impalpable veil that shrouds it from our eyes, a world is, which is not empty, but teeming with life, uh, but with the reservation that it is murky and a dim unknown, and so near the region of insanity that the prudent person with due regard his own reputation, should give it a wide as birth as possible. As H.P. H. P. Lovecraft noted, the oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear, and the oldest and strongest kind of fear is the fear of the unknown. So Stead intends Borderland to be a way to conquer this foolish and fatal dread. Um, he says, Borderland can hardly fail to ho rid whole regions of the mist and darkness with which they are enshrouded, and also to enable the man of science to construct from the multitude of recorded observations, some working hypotheses that will give us clue to the fresh mastery of the great forces of nature of which we at the present moment gain but occasional fra fragmentary glimpses. So however dreadful the unknown, Stead really wants to know, and um, he's using Borderland as a ship into this land, he talks about it as a ship, a little caravel, as, which is a small sailing ship, and likens it to sailing to Spain. Um, and obviously the sea has always been a metaphor for the unknown. Uh, so he's using Borderland as a sort of object to negotiate it. So this is the Cartel Marina to talk about the idea of the unknown and the monstrous. Uh, made in 1527, it's the origin of the phrase, here be monsters. Uh, and the ocean is really an engine for the trauma of modernity. It op sea travel opened up the world, uh, it promotes integration, mixing, discovery, it represents spreading contamination. Uh, John Berger said, ours is the century of enforced travel, the century of disappearances, the century of people helplessly seeing others who are close to them disappear over the horizon. So he's talking about the sea, but this is also true of the occult, the need for us to negotiate that horizon that separates us from the dead. And this negotiation will be absolutely rigorous. Stead says, the phenomena of the borderland have not yet been subjected to the close, systematic and sustained investigation which has been found necessarily in the physical sciences. So it's telling that he repeatedly appeals to science because it represents order and rigor, some sort of crucifix against the unknown. Um, I won't read the whole quote, but he talks about the idea of democratizing the study of the spook um, because it occurs to, uh, psychic phenomena occur to general members of the public every day and they don't have the power to record them. So crime also represents the unknown and the crime scene photographs provides us with the who, what, when, and where, but not the why of crime. Um, it places us beyond the law, beyond the moral limit. Kristeva writes that crime is abject because it draws attention to the fragility of the law and the fragility of the border. Uh, she writes, it is not lack of cleanliness or health that causes objection, but what disturbs identity, system, order. What does not respect borders, positions, rules. The in-between, the ambiguous, the composite. The, killer, the, the traitor, the li liar, the criminal with a good conscience. The shameless rapist, the killer who claims he is a savior. Uh, crime creates a proximity to the corpse. It brings us closer to the dead. It draws attention to the fragility of the boundaries of the body, uh, disrupting a notion which is key to the understanding of both crime and the occult in terms of spirit photography, which is the notion of one's own and clean self. Um, the notion of one o one's own and clean self is described by Kristeva as the underpinnings of any organization constituted by exclusions and hierarchies of any rational society. 
So the opposite of one's own clean self is, as she writes, filth and defile defilement. That is what that which is excluded from the symbolic system, what ex escapes social rationality, the logical order on which a social aggregate is based. So the dead, uh, whether they are ghosts or victims of crime, upset these hierarchies of society, this social rationality and this logical order. They disrupt the symbolic system. Spirit photography, here is Stead appearing to his, in a photograph with his daughter Estelle. Uh, it shows us as there what is not there. Um, a presence where there should be no presence. And crime scene photographs, this is Fiji, um, show us what should not be there um, as there jetted into our world. Um, so this idea of uh, presence having a foot in both one world and the next um, highlights the border, as Chris David describes it. So again, the notion of one's own and clean self is threatened by um, these entities because they betray the boundaries of the actual physical body. The idea of blood... Um, Spittle blood, milk, urine, feces, and tears are fine once they're inside the body because they're part of the symbolic system, but once they traverse the boundaries of the body, they become filthy and uncanny. The spirit of the, in the photograph has also betrayed the boundaries of the body. Um, Roger introduced us to uh, William Stainton Moses, and he originated the soon generally accepted idea that um, the spirit was a fluidic substance molded from e ectoplasm issuing from the dead. So this is a clear um, traversing of the Chris Davin border. Um, and here we have a photograph by Sally Mann from a body farm where you can see the actual physical um, exit of things from the body. Uh, and so disintegration and fluidity mean unstable identities. And the spirit photograph is an attempt to fix that identity in place uh, into a narrative that contains and reconfigures the ectoplasm, recreates it in the form of a person, a part of society. It draws attention to the reality uh, the, 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 this kind of photograph, the, the, the corpse draws attention to the reality of the body rather than the reality of the body as part of society. So the spirit photograph makes an object from death in the same way that I, in my drawings I try to create an object for me to negotiate the reality of the corpse, uh, which Chris Deva writes about as um, cesspool, the corpse as cesspool and death, um, a wound with blood and pus, it does not signify death. In the presence of signified death, a flat encephalograph, for example, I would understand, react, or accept. No, as in true theater, without makeup or masks, refuse and corpses show me what I must permanently thrust aside in order to live, the border of my condition as a living being. Um, so I really like this idea of the border of the condition of it as a living being. And this is a um, sculpture I made looking at the disintegration of body into non-body, which is sort of ideologically horrific to us. Um, H.P. Lovecraft wrote again that no death, no doom, no anguish can arouse the surpassing despair which flows from a loss of identity. Merging with nothing, nothingness is peaceful oblivion, but to be aware of existence and yet to know that one is no longer a definite being distinguished from other beings, that one no longer has a self, that is a nameless summit of agony and dread. Um, so this is a poor chap and he's made of soap and uh, he's floating in a water bath and over the course of the exhibition he's, he becomes sort of a indeterminate being because the, the soap dissolves and, but stays sort of in the form of a person. So I actually came to Kristeva after completing the graphic novel Heart of Darkness and when Conrad wrote Heart of Darkness it was a reaction to the brutal colonization of Congo by King Leopold of Belgium um, and in, in, the, in Heart of Darkness Marlowe arrives in the Congo with an idea of the natives that he has accessed through language, through narrative and over the course of the book, he becomes aware of the reality of the occupation as something horrific rather than noble. And we can trace this through his encounters with the bodies of the natives. He first perceives them as a sort of whirl of black limbs, a mass of hands clapping, of feet stamping, of bodies swaying, of eyes rolling, a black incomprehensible frenzy with no individual identity, but gradually begins to feel what he, what he calls a kind of partnership. He writes, the earth seemed unearthly. We are accustomed to look upon the shackled form of a conquered monster, but there, there you could look at a thing mon monstrous and free. It was unearthly, and the men were, no, they were not inhuman. Well, you know, that was the worst of it, this suspicion of their not being inhuman. It would come slowly to one. They howled and leaped and spun and made horrid faces, but what thrilled you was just the thought of their humanity, like yours, the thought of your remote kinship with this wild and passionate uproar. So Marlowe's awakening in Heart of Darkness is this growing sense of kinship he has with the other, and he's, con he's 
constantly coming closer and closer to what Kosovo describes as their border. And this comes most savagely to him when he's sort of literally confronted with both the other and the ultimate object in the form of the corpse in, on a stick drying out, uh, on a chopped head drying outside Kurtz's window. Um, and he sees himself in this object because they've been brought to the point, this point by the same forces of colonialism. So his own unclean self is threatened by the corpse and by his proximity to it. It's death without a narrative because it's the corpse itself unsignified. Um, and I composed that spread as a reaction to this photograph in which um, a man is contemplating the hand and foot of his five-year-old daughter. Uh, this is sort of the reality of colonialism um, because he didn't collect enough rubber that was his punishment. She was um, killed and cannibalized. Um, and so this is sort of the, the, the reality of, of um, what comes to us in the form of narrative, usually. So we can look at the idea of signified death, as Chris ever says, um, which is the spirit photograph as an invisible corpse, um, a corpse which is wrapped in narrative and is not really an intrusion into life. But murder victims um, disrupt the order of society because from a position of invisibility, they suddenly become hyper-visible. This is just a, one simple Google Images search. Um, when Michael Brown was shot in Ferguson, I'll talk more about that. While the dead are always excluded from life, many vi murder victims are excluded from social narratives even before death. They did not exist as individuals in the public eye because they are often the poor, the women, the people of color. In recent times, as Stead writes, we are de democratizing every everything and nothing has made the corpse so visible as CCTV and mobile phone footage. Suddenly the dead are assuming a place in society, in public printed space not unlike spirit photographs in a way, because these are people who should not occupy this heightened space, yet here they are. Um, here are some protests. Um, so this intrusion into public space is a, a constant reminder that the border between us and them is shown up as perceived and not real. The reason we fear the other is because we fear the existence of the other in ourselves. It comes closer and closer to home. So as technology advances, it brings us closer to the border. I think this is what Stead wanted, but I'm going to argue that maybe that's not so good. The advances in photography that brought spirits into photos, brought Ouija into Hollywood, and brings the dead right into our homes through TV. But these images in our homes are not sort of uh, Ouija's uh, fantastic photos with a tinge of Hollywood glamour. They're literally our backyards, our neighborhoods, banal spaces, uh, suddenly occupied by ghosts. Um, in T.S. Eliot's courses from The Rock, from his 1934 poem, The Wasteland, the abject is found to be a condition that man can, mankind carries within himself, not one that he is subjected to. We do not just inhabit the wasteland, but this desert is in fact us. It says, second, you neglect and belittle the desert. The desert is not remote in southern tropics. The desert is not only around the corner. The desert is squeezed in the tr tube train next to you. The desert is in the heart of your brother. So what is the actual physical space of this borderland? I think it's a physical space overlaid with a mental space, which we can call a heterotopia. It's something editable and fragmented in, both the, ca in the case of both spirit photography and CCTV. Space becomes destabilized by CCTV because like in a residual haunting, we return over and over again to one moment of time or one event, um, oh, this is fun. Uh, which lifts these particular seconds out of a continuum and places them outside narrative sequence uh, and a narrative hierarchy, which is not how film works, it is not how, t how time works, um, and it's not how space works. CCTV and spirit photography remind us that space is not neutral or governable. It makes the space uncanny. When we view CCTV, this is um, a CCTV of a woman called Jill Mayer, who was murdered shortly after she walked off. Uh, when we view CCTV, the subject is often already dead, yet here they are, walking, looping, inhabiting a borderland. Um, so in the drawings, this is the drawing of that event. In my drawings, I attempt to uh, recreate that space of the borderland because the drawings um, are neither still nor moving image. They're in between, sort of intentionally ambiguous, neither negative or positive. This is how I, I draw them in negative and then make them positive later. Uh, they're not photo nor drawing nor sculpture and they're impossible to look at straight on unless you're looking at them now because I've photographed them for you. <laughs> um, so this is a film I, I'm, uh, I won't have the sound on. Okay, the perception of space is also related to the understanding of time, and this is why I find CCTV so uh, interesting. 
As I said, this repetition is not how time works, but somehow lifting the subject out of time and watching these last movements over and over creates in me a profound empathy rather than a revulsion. Repeating the short loop returns us over and over to the same moment, allowing for a constant rereading of the space. It almost becomes something else removed from the murder. CCTV is not neutral, it has no narrative, but repetition creates narrative, and that's soothing. So this is um, film, uh, a redrawn film of uh, the shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri in America last year. Um, and when I saw this footage, I went through the classic stages of obje objection, the reaction to the corpse, the sort of idea of meaninglessness, and I decided to create an animation rather than a drawing to physically spend time with the imagery uh, and to create some sort of meaning of the time he lay there. He was there for four hours on a hot pavement without being covered because before they took him away. Um, so the redrawing also causes the paper to tear and rupture, which um, made me think of the disruption of public space uh, by this, um, these kinds of events uh, as a physical manifestation on the paper and also the, the fires that came afterwards. So this um, emotional and public disruption of space is something that I've tried to tackle in the way that this and other images are drawn using the pencil to literally distress the surface of the paper until it disintegrates. It creates a, a symbolic, not a factual reconstruction of the event, but um, one which has a different kind of truth to it. This is a close-up of another image which is um, based on the death of a woman called Patric Patricia Miller, and she was tied to her bed by a man called James Barnes, and he set fire to the bed. So here I've drawn the bed and again distressed the paper so that it appears, appears charred. Um, and in the sort of idea of interior crime scenes, I find it interesting because here we have crime disrupting a very private and seemingly safe space. Um, and the, I, the classic idea of the unknown is a more monstrous or exotic space, uh, something far away to be glimpsed like steadrites through a veil. So this is again from Heart of Darkness and we're right in that borderland in Heart of Darkness. Conrad writes, uh, land in a swamp, march through the woods and in some inland post feel the savagery, the utter savagery had closed around him. All that mysterious life in the wilderness, uh, of the wilderness that stirs in the forest, in the jungles, in the hearts of wild men. There's no initiation either into such mysteries. He has to live in the midst of it, the incomprehensible, which is also detestable. And it has a fascination too that goes to work upon him. The fascination of the abomination, you know, imagine the growing regrets, the longing to escape, the powerless disgust, the surrender, the hate. The overwhelming realities of this strange world of plants and water and silence never welcomes nor accepts Marlowe and Kurtz. It confounds Marlowe and, and it provides an alibi, a setting, and ex an excuse for the awakening of forgotten and brutal instincts in Kurtz. The place ex so the place itself helps them to reach the limits of their morality. Our horror of exterior crime scenes comes in part from the fact that they place on us a understanding of a space that is at the limit of our knowledge. Um, I'm sure everyone knows this is from the Brady and Hindley murders, and Eugene Thack Thacker says, the demon often inhabits the edges of human understanding of the world, and it is true that crime scenes are often hinterlands, forests, moors, the bottom of the sea, the edges of reason, the fringes, not the center, but the limit. So the act of crime, which is horrific isn't enough, is also made uh, physically unnavigable. So in our times, nothing has illustrated the borderland more horrifically than the child murders by Ian Brady and Maya Hindley, uh, because the moral border has so been so disrupted, but also the physical space so resembles the borderland. It's literally Conrad's myths of the incomprehensible. And it's telling when we think about the idea of space that we refer to these as the Moore's murderers, not, as, not by the names of the perpetrators. Um, so Conrad's quote also perfectly illustrates our public relationship with these murders, um, with the abject. As he says, it has a fascination that goes to work upon him, the fascination of the abomination, the powerless disgust, the surrender, the hate. And the need to create narrative is a public act, like a collective act. It's a reorganization of public space, an attempt to reinstate the boundary between pri private and public. Stead was adamant that the public be involved in the creation of his borderland, because we commit to a an, a, in this sort of thing, we commit to a central monster to make sure that evil is contained. G.K. Chesterton said that there is nothing more frightening than a labyrinth without a center. When there is no more minotaur at the center, there is just winding corridors, more twists and turns. Um, so, again. Uh, we have the reality of the crime scene. Uh, this was a shooting in Kenya. Um, the corpse, the thing on the edge of non-existence and hallucination. 
reality that if I acknowledge it, annihilates me, says Chris Deva. So to avoid annihilation, we need a border. Peri periodicals, fiction, art, entertainment all provide us with that border between us and either the occult or modern day crime. They're, they are a relationship with the subject through an object. Narrative is a way to apply reason to the unreasonable. So this is my um, reinterpretation of that event. Um, I see narrative as a way to create structure from chaos. These are images I made for the bicentennial of Jon Snow's discovery of how cholera was spreading through the water system uh, in London in 1854. Um, so I was exploiting the fact that soap, soap distorts as it, it's painted in soap, um, distorts as it dries. So um, at first sight, the image is sort of benign and domestic, but over time it starts shrinking and cracking. Um, revealing hidden stresses and weaknesses in the system where we would least expect them. Relating to the idea of London's water system, seemingly a source of life, being a hidden source of death. Um, they talk about the fact that the very thing people thought was curing them, hygiene and water, was killing them. So the system and soap and water, of wa and water has failed. Um, Stead is attracted to the dim unknown, but also wary of it. So to remedy this, he ap appeals to science, something that represents order, again, a system. The law is our science when it comes to crime. And that's interesting when we look at this uh, police shooting. This was uh, Trayvon Martin, who was shot in 2015. This was the first police shooting um, um, of this sort of series from, from 2015 to now, which has created a massive public um, outcry. Um, sorry, th this is, so this is the drawing. This is a um, crime scene photograph, and this is the space in which he was found. Um, so. When we don't uh, respect the rules, meaning collapses, but what happens when the rules themselves are ambiguous on, or fluid? The law is our structure, it defines boundaries for us. Crime, therefore, draws attention to the fragility of the law and inspires horror. But what is even more horrific is not when the law is broken, but when the law itself is wrong. When we experience a collapse of the only system by which we can live, we feel this co cognitive dissonance. The American public reacted to the Trayvon Martin case, the first of many miscarriages of justice in the cases of police shootings, with the fervor that we can see in the protests and movement movements happening today. In Heart of Darkness, Marlowe also understands that he's implicit in institutional horror. He says, after all, I was also part of the great cause of these high and just proceedings, but he increasingly rejects it. At one point, looking at the shrunken heads lined up outside Kurtz's house, he cuts short a description of how the local tribes adore Kurtz. He says, the camps of these people surrounded the place and the chiefs came every day to see him. They would crawl. I don't want to know anything of the ceremonies used when approaching Mr. Kurtz, I shouted. Curious, this feeling that came over me that such details would be more intolerable than those heads drying on the stakes under Mr. K under Mr. Kurtz's windows. After all, the heads were only a savage sight, while I seemed at one bound to have been transported into some lightless region of subtle horrors where pure, uncomplicated savagery was a positive li relief being something that had a right to exist in the sunshine. So I think that Conrad, through Marlowe, is trying to make a clear distinction between what we think of as barbarism and the larger question of the subtle horrors um, of the Belgian occupation. So he's questioning the morality of a chain of events that has led to a situation so perverse, this crawling of the tribe towards Kurtz, that he cannot look it in the eye. So I think savagery has a right to exist in the sunshine, but the insidious effects of the Belgian occupation do not. In another of Conrad's novels, uh, Lord Jim, a nautical assessor, uh, sorry, in another of Conrad's novels called Lord Jim, a nautical assessor called Big Really commits suicide soon after the trial in which he finds Jim guilty. He throws himself overboard. Uh, Conrad makes it clear that Brearley has found, it, um, ha found, found his decision uh, and the idea of law itself unsupportable. He commits suicide because the law as a system is not absolute and yet we have no other system by which to live. He writes, he jumped overboard at sea barely a week after the end of the inquiry as though on that exact spot in the midst of the waters, he had suddenly perceived the gates of the other world flung open wide for his reception. The problem with probing the unknown, like Stead wants to do, is at a point there becomes a place of too much knowledge. If the unknown is horrific, well then all, all the knowledge is deadly, and the world becomes a labyrinth without a center. And this is obviously William Blake, who talks about the doors of perception. Uh, if they were cleansed, everything would appear um, to man as it is, infinite. Um, Dostoevsky writes sort of further to that. There are seconds, they come five or six at a time, when you suddenly feel the presence of eternal harmony in all its fullness. 
it is nothing earthly. I don't mean that it is heavenly, but a man in his earthly semblance can't endure it. He has to, go on, he has to undergo a physical change or die. This feeling is clear and unmistakable. It is, as, it is as though you suddenly apprehended all nature and suddenly said, yes, it is true, it is good. If it went on for more than five seconds, the soul could not endure it and must perish. So uh, this is just as a sort of response to Stead's idea of probing the unknown. And finally, the story of the Zapruder film um, is this kind of extrapolation of Stead's desires to pierce the veil. Here in the modern world, uh, film has finally become fast enough to capture the moments in between the moments. And this is a film made of the assassination of John F. Kennedy, captured on a home movie camera by Abraham Zapruder in 1963. One frame of film, frame 313, has been removed from the official version. It's, it's not only viscerally horrific because it shows his head exploding, but it also supports the theory of a second gunman, which contradicts official record that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. So frame 313 robs us of a sense of an ending. It opens up the possibilities of too much behind the veil. It was rejected from history according to Errol Morris, who made a documentary about it to wrest back control from the chaos. Uh, and Ron Rosenbaum, who wrote about the Zapruder film, tells us that in the end, the inexplicabil inexplicability of horror is equaled by the horror of inexplicability. But maybe it even trumps it. The agony of not knowing is equal to the agony of knowing too much. The trauma of the law and the system by which we live being wrong, that the narrative is not neutral and not set in stone, becomes a labyrinth without a center. The fear that the law could turn on the innocent, on you, uh, and that justice is not guaranteed, is horrific. The fact, the idea that you could be at the center of the wrong story is uh, something which I think Stead would have been interested in today. This is um, two images. It's the first is Columbus sailing off in 1492 to spearhead the slave trade and genocide. Um, but it's a sort of heroic image where here is um, migrants arriving in the Mediterranean. And um, sort of the, the way we see the world in terms of narrative uh, is ambiguous, he says. We, the idea of the hero and the, the voyage and the quest and the return uh, isn't as simple as we once thought. Um, so going back to the sea, this is an image that I made in relationship to the migrant crossings, um, again, in the same way that I did the one from Kenya. What I do is number the dead. This is a small fragment of it. They were 2,600 in one year. Uh, and then rub them out uh, so that we have the presence but it also have the evocation of the sea. So uh, another stanza in Choruses from the Rock could be an exact description of the crossing of the Mediterranean, uh, Stead's little caravel and the piercing of the impenetrable veil. Waste and void, waste and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the spirit moved upon the face of the water, as the air of the temperate seas is pierced by the still dead breath of the ar arctic current, and they came to an end, the dead end stirred with a flicker of life. <laughs>